there's a secret potential asset behind Oliver Heaviside's solution to the transatlantic telegraph cable problem of the 1880s. I don't know if any other inventor made use of it. And even Oliver Heaviside did not make use of it. Um, it was the people who inherited his solution who implemented this idea, a, a modification of his solution, which was to not carry the length of the iron wrappings around the insulated copper core all the way to both terminals, but to cut it short by a few miles on either side. Now, the iron ribbon or iron wire, the bare iron ribbon and the bare iron wire that was wrapped around the insulated copper core was never con electrically connected to that copper core in the first place. It was merely meant to wrap it with an iron sheath such that the magnetism generated by the voltage drop of that inductive component, namely the transmission line, um, boy, it's such a long sentence, I, I've lost the track of the beginning. It was meant to sustain that magnetic field because magnetism normally drops off very quickly over long distances. Well, it doesn't last over long distances. It gets out of phase relation. It, it separates from being in phase with the voltage component, namely the electrostatic, the dielectric component. The two fields, the electric field and the magnetic field. The magnetic field starts to fall behind. Um, and what this does is it's Mother Nature's way of safeguarding against um, the universe blowing up as a default condition. She wants free energy because it's through free energy that free matter the, uh, occurs, namely the creation of matter from so-called empty space. So-called only because we don't understand the mechanics involved because we never bother to study it because we assume it does not exist and that uh, the fable of um, Christ uh, ma um, multiplying the fishes and the loaves of bread is just a nice fairy tale. Yet it's not. Matter, or I should say energy, is a, a mere feature or characteristic of matter. It, in other words, matter is always changing, it's always dynamic, while space is always standing still, non-dynamic. Space never changes. Thus, space is empty of matter. But matter always has to be dynamic in order to be matter. It, it's one of its qualifications. Unless it goes into a virtual state of uh, pra pralaya, but that's a whole other topic in itself. One which I don't, you know, really understand very well. Um, so, since magnetism is allowed and encouraged by default to fall behind, what we end up with is basically voltage. And that's why the ultimate and accurate way of depicting Ohm's law is not current times voltage, because that's a shortcut. It's really voltage squared divided by resistance equals watts. Because ultimately, voltage drop is the only thing that thermodynamics recognizes that voltage diminishes <clears throat> or changes. It increases or diminishes, whatever. It all has to come out to zero so that it's not energy in equals energy out, but that voltage in has to equal voltage out. That's the, that's, it comes out of voltage drop, that statement that energy in equals energy out, um, <clears throat> is not really accurate because it's not really saying where that statement came from. What justifies that statement is voltage drop. And what justifies voltage drop is the default condition that magnetism lags behind voltage so that ultimately voltage is the only thing that matters because you're going to lose the magnetism anyway over long distances. Um, and then voltage drop is valid. And voltage throughput is the only solution that common sense has come up with. Outs ignoring Oliver Heaviside completely. Now, what does the simulator do? The simulator allows 
for a phenomenon to occur that most people don't take advantage of, yet I do. And that is that components are treated as separate entities. Not wire, because the wire is just a connection between nodes, uniting them to become one shared node between components, kind of like valence electrons between uh, two adjacent copper atoms and a piece of copper wire, let's say. But be that as it may, that's, that's an, uh, that analogy is not worth pursuing at the moment because I'm trying to focus on something else. So, in the simulator, each component is given its own value, its own identity, separate from all the other components. But in the real world, that doesn't occur because of the lagging magnetic field creates this preponderance of the voltage field, the electric field, as the only phenomenon, not the dominant, but the only phenomenon that matters. And this safeguards the blowing up, the uh, spontaneous explosion of the universe, of creation, but it also gives us the view of physics that everything is winding down and cannot be done any other way. In other words, free energy does not exist. Well, I'm here to tell you it does exist because Mother Nature potentially put a safe, or not a safeguard, <laughs> a, um, a gimme, a, a freebie, but hidden, a potential freebie on how to get around that problem and create free energy. And she uses it all the time, but she's one of the few individuals who are, who are privy to this little secret. Now, I can call it the Oliver Heaviside secret because even though he didn't implement it, he created the, a condition by which some very uh, innovative uh, humans who followed after him went and modified the telegraph, the transatlantic telegraph cable, to make it more efficient. And that is snipping the two ends of the iron wrapping around the insulated copper core by a s several miles on each side so that it exposed the two ends for a very short distance by comparison to the length, the total length of the, tra of the transatlantic cable, <clears throat> telegraph cable, snipped the two ends of, of what was previously the preservation of the magnetic field at those, those two ends. And now, instead, those two ends were allowed to dissipate the magnetism, <clears throat> not conserve it, <laughs> nice use of the word conserve, but allow it to fall out of phase. And what does that do? It makes the telegraph, transatlantic telegraph cable, a component separate from the prime mover that's driving it. So now we have two components to the telegraph cable. The prime mover, namely the voltage coming, you know, passing through the telegraph keys and giving the signals that are carried across the Atlantic, and the transmission line itself. <coughs> <clears throat> Sorry. So now I have two distinct components. Now, the simulator does that automatically. It makes all the components unique. And thus, by arranging things in a certain way, I can get free energy because each component is unique. But in the real world, that doesn't happen because magnetism drops behind. It's not retained. And all we are left with is voltage drop. As if electrical reactance does not exist, even though <clears throat> it's incorporated into the equations of how a coil functions in a simulator and how a capacitor functions in a simulator, yet for all intents and purposes, it's as if those electrical formula, formulae are of no use and no value. It's really bizarre. But this, and this is why we default to the use of the exclusive use of copper cable to carry voltage across, you know, whatever, ignoring what Oliver Heaviside gave us and the people who came after him is the secret to free energy. What, uh, something I had overlooked up to this point is that components must be allowed to have their own identity apart from all the other components so that they can then potentially behave independent of all the other components. Now, the simulator, I can get that to happen easily. I can get the voltage and the current 
to go out of phase by 180 degrees and then all of a sudden each component behaves as a separate entity doing its own dance and although frequency unites them with a common beat of sorts but they're out of phase but they still have a common beat so it's a syncopation a syncopated beat in which the current is syncopated relative to the voltage so the frequency of current and the frequency of voltage are syncopated out of sync with each other by 180 degrees which is what a syncopated beat is that's the whole basis to the musical definition of a syncopation is that you've got you know two sets of beats and one beats on the silent phase of the other each beats on the silent phase of the other so that you get a double frequency beat yet in the case of electrodynamics you don't just get a faster beat unfortunately you get something else you get current out of phase with voltage and you no longer have electricity anymore you've pulled apart the two forces the magnetomotive force and the, and the electromotive force to such a degree that of angular separation that they don't unite to create the phenomenon that we know of as ener as electrical energy which we take to be a singularity a singular um, energetic phenomenon or entity but it's not it's made up of ingredients and they have to be in phase to be electricity anyway so this is what the secret to Oliver Heaviside's electrical um, transatlantic telegraph cable amounts to and once we get the components separated from each other now how do we do that okay I was trying to envision in my mind so I made a shopping list of various things I should get on Amazon and it amounts to something like a hundred dollars to be able to make my latest circuit I've never made any of my circuits I tried to in the beginning back in 2013 and I did I, I tried to make um, Eric Dollard's analog computer in LMD mode and I failed to produce any results I did not use a man-made power source I used a grounded flue it came out of the water heater uh, that you know was in the guest house that I was staying at um, the grounded flue the flue went up to the surface of the roof the roof was vaulted very high it was something like 20 feet off the ground and I tested it against ground because I was curious to see if it was grounded or not and it was so here I had an aerial a grounded aerial and I used it and all I got out of my circuit was half a volt which is you know a lot of voltage but that's only because the flue was that high up off the ground did I get that otherwise I wouldn't have gotten anything so it was creating a separation between the earth and the altitude above it which amounted to half a volt so I, I shouldn't be surprised and I wasn't but that's all I got so I, I told Mark McKay at the first um, conference that I went to in Idaho in 20, um, 2013 so I did this experiment in the spring and then in the summer I went to the conference and I said you know what my guess is is that I had too much capacitance and not enough inductance and so the capacitance overwhelmed or overruled the inductance and that's why I got all voltage and no current and no no buildup of voltage like um, Dollard uh, signifies in his video from the 1980s and you know I had about, I think three modules three daisy chained modules and on a, pe on a um, project board you know um, you stick the components into the holes um, so I didn't get the same results and that's what and he agreed with me that that's probably what, what was going on probably there were other things going on too but at least that was one guess estimate that I made of the situation and he agreed with me so I haven't built anything since then so I'm, I'm making the shopping list of one of the latest circuits I, uh, the latest book I published on Amazon uh, this circuit is awesome um, and I was wondering how do I implement Oliver Heaviside solution to the transatlantic uh, telegraph cable problem into the circuit I know I have to because I'm claiming that it's Tesla's trimetal generator and the latest version of the circuit that I simulated the only way that I could justify grouping um, 
the various self-inductances into separate mutual inductive groups, even though they're in, cl in close proximity with each other, was to wrap, uh, divide the circuit into three, se uh, three blocks. Uh, because the circuit is basically a multitude of rings that are connected at one point um, electrically, while magnetically all of them are connected together but in groups, N even though technically most people, you know, staunch conservatives, when they, when they look at it and they say, well, that's fraud because <laughs> real world you can't do that. Um, they'd all be lumped as one lumped induct, um, group of inductors, but a single lumping, a single magnetic coupling among all of them instead of separate magnetic couplings. Even though I might have the same value, but they're uh, lumped separately, and so the simulator treats them as separate lumpings. And this is important because if you don't, <clears throat> then you won't get the uh, phase transition of 180 uh, separation of 180 degrees separation between the current and the voltage. It all gets smushed together, and you get nothing, and, and the circuit goes comatose. So these are loops that are magnetically linked in groups, but electrically connected at a single point. So it's kind of like figure eight taken a little further in which you have more than just two loops connected at a single point like a figure eight signifies, which is the, in, uh, the, the symbol for infinity. Um, you have multiple loops, but they're still all connected at a single point, and that single point is grounded. Um, so you have two different connections, an electrical connection for the electric field and a magnetic connection for the magnetic field, two different types of connections. Um, <clears throat> but so I was thinking to myself well how do I separate them so I created three blocks and, and it's more than f um, it's several self inductors that are um, mutually coupled um, one, um, one mutual coupling involves two coils another one to the left of that involves three coils or four, I think, it, you know, I think it's four. Right, it's four. And then one on the right is another four. And then, I mean, this is just the way I broke up all the loops <laughs> um, when I did this. Um, so their common node was a common ground. Um, and then the third set, and then, uh, no, the fourth set of... Um, of, of um, lumped inductors, I, I called the load because it's the load and then a linking coil. That's not considered a load, but it's there with the load. And so I had four different lumped inductances, even though technically they, most people would take one look at that, and LT Spice would take one look at that and say, no, 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 you can't do that. You have to group them all together as one lumped mutual inductance among all those coils. Um, and but what I do to get away with it is I use one in, inductor in each of those four lumpings that is shared with one at least one other set of lumpings, so that all the sets are ultimately linked, but only in a partial way. Anyway, how do you go about doing that in the real world? So I thought to myself, okay. I'll group those four lumped inductances into um, uh, let's see three sets because w the fourth one I'll split between two of them two of the three sets the, the fourth lumped inductance and those three divisions will be copper aluminum ruled by copper alone copper and iron, and copper and um, aluminum. So copper combined with... So what I'll do is I'll have everything electrically connected as copper wire, and then in two of those three blocks involving three lumped inductances, I will use either iron to signify one signature, 
versus aluminum of the other to signify a different signature by wrapping aluminum around the insulated copper magnetic wire versus iron. And the iron and the aluminum will be bare. It, they will not be um, insulated wire. They'll be bare wire. Because I'm only trying to create paramagnetism in one set versus ferromagnetism in the other, each, in each case wrapped around diamagnetism of the copper, insulated copper, to create a unique signature for those two groups. And then in the third group, that is strictly copper, I won't have anything wrapped around it, and it'll only have the signature of diamagnetism with, without any ferromagnetism or paramagnetism influencing, influencing its magnetic signature. Okay, so then when I got my shopping list together, one of the items I had to get was a project board, you know, that you push, you know, your components into, and you can vary how you connect them and whatnot. So it's kind of like using uh, clip leads, you know, which all Eric Dollar said don't do. Solder everything <laughs> or weld if you can. But, you know, I can't do it. My soldering skills are zero. So this has to work without that admonition from Eric. It has to work anyway. So I thought Oliver Heaviside's solution to the transatlantic cable at, at problem of the 1880s and the people who came after him who, sh who shortened the length, all of that, maybe will help me get over this. But how do I do that? How do I do this? Because just taking, for instance, bare iron wire to help um, preserve the magnetic field to um, eliminate it falling out of phase with the voltage field, how do I actually go ahead and wrap the um, coils and their connections to other components, how do I do that when I'm using a project board in which I can't carry the um, wrapping across the solder joint to the next component because the project board is in the way. The two ends, let's say it's a, a resistor versus a, no, uh, let's say it's a coil versus a diode because I have that in, in my circuit. I have diodes adjacent to coils or capacitors adjacent to coils, how do I get them, well, maybe not in the case of the capacitor, but in the case of the, um, anyway, how do I do this? How do I do the wrappings? And so I thought, well, why not sh not try to fight it or worry about it? Why not just go with the flow, you know, and carry the iron wire or the aluminum wire across to the other component ignoring the solder joint altogether and as if it does not exist of any importance and then I thought after then I thought um, I think it was yesterday that's perfect because when you consider the fact that a solder joint is a galvanic joint in which you've got different materials um, mixed up there creating a voltage difference which cancels out but still all the same it is galvanic and as I know from prior experience, you know, you know we all know galvanic um, is the equivalent of a battery. Any battery of any voltage will screw the thing up. And so I kind of feared for the last several weeks or months that it wasn't going to work because all the joints have to be welded, not soldered. But now in thinking about, okay, my shopping list and I got to get a project board, well, I'm not going to weld, am I? I'm not even going to solder. They're going to be poked in to the metallic film that's sandwiched inside that um, project board, that bead board or whatever it's called. It's probably made out of copper or brass or something. It's not going to be the same material as, because uh, I know the ends of a resistor, for instance, are not copper wire. There's some kind of, I don't know, stainless steel or something. So I'm already going to get a galvanic response just by pushing these components into the project board so it, it started to appear to me appeal to me yesterday that maybe this is a good thing because it'll force me to take let's say the iron wire and it'll be separated from the connection nodes the the two connection nodes actually between two adjacent components it'll carry the magnetic field away from them be, you know, the, the magnetic field that's being boosted in the iron wrapping, let's say, it'll carry it away. 
so that the, the, the disruption of the galvanic response will not be that much of a, of a disruption. It won't have that much influence. It'll have a diminished influence. While the, each component will get an enhanced influence, and, and this is what happened just now before I started this recording, and a unique identity. Each component will no longer schmush or, or um, combine, <laughs> if you want the real English term, combine its magnetic field with the magnetic field of the, of the its of adjacent of any adjacent component on either side of it or however many there are connected to it um it won't carry across so the only thing that'll carry across is the voltage field the magnetic field will stay isolated within each component exactly the way the transatlantic telegraph cable became after all of heavy side suggested uh, wrapping the the uh, transmission line with bare iron wire. I will literally be doing the same thing of shortening the magnetic wrapping, the iron wrapping, by a percentage not unlike, although you know a bit different, but similar in that it'll be a minor shortening. But you know what do we do with uh, silicon wafers? We dope them with trace elements. So this is kind of a similar principle. And it shouldn't be surprising, though, that not only is uh, this principle similar to um, the fabrication of uh, transistors and whatnot, you know, silicon transistors, but it's all, uh, this circuit that I'm working on is predicated on transistors. This I got from uh, Mitko, I believe his name is, uh, in the uh, electrical science uh, space on Quora where he's a fellow contributor, because um, I never understood transistors. I never studied them, and, and frankly, I never thought they were utilized 100 years ago by anybody uh, performing free energy uh, development. But I was wrong. Um, in the patent to the EV Gray motor, they actually, besides a full bridge rectification of four diodes, they also have in that schematic a pair of diodes... Uh, linked in series that are either facing away from each other, the cathodes, or facing towards each other. I can't remember which. And this phenomenon of pairing diodes and having them face in opposite directions is utilized by uh, Spectrum Software in their uh, macro for a uh, neon bulb spark gap. And, you know, this I, I was introduced to these things, but it usually takes me time to... Uh, grow into an under appreciation and an understanding of what they signify. So in the old days, a hundred years ago, you, you would have, they would have created transistors out of vacuum tubes. The vacuum tubes that signify diodes and just face them, the, their cathodes in opposite directions, either towards each other or away from each other, and do a few other uh, changes to their connections, and you've got yourself a diode, uh, excuse me, a transistor. Uh, either a PNP or an NPN. <clears throat> so this latest circuit that I think is so awesome utilizes two pairs of diodes, one pair facing their cathodes facing each other and one pair uh, uh, cathodes facing away from each other, and they're on two separate loops that are magnetically coupled together, and I consider that to be the spine of the circuit, the, the, the foundation of the circuit. Um... <clears throat> without which the circuit would not function. Well, <laughs> and the two uh, tracks ad adjacent to each other, uh, to, adjacent to the spine on either side, will also make it function. I mean, all of the components make it function. All of the features, all of the loops, without them it, it just doesn't work. But the spine is the first one that I consider the most important. Um, so I guess, you know, this is a very interesting presumption on my part because I haven't built it yet but just trying to imagine in my mind you know okay the simulation is one thing but how how do you derive how do you interpret the simulation into a real world build because that's you know the simulation is one thing it, it re all the simulation does is represent the mathematics and that's why I can look peculiar like my god how am I supposed to build this because it doesn't look like a normal circuit it doesn't even look like a circuit that you can build well, you have to interpret it. You have to know how, and that takes some time, not just developing this, the simula simulation, but 
developing an understanding of how to do the translation into the into a real world build, and that's why I take my sweet time because you don't you just don't take it at face value and expect it to work because it probably won't, and this is the criticism I've gotten from people ah that's not going to work, well they don't know what it is it represents something in the real world and not everybody has misunderstood some did understand correctly because they didn't accept it on its face value and they said build draw us a schematic of you know what we're supposed to build they implied they didn't say that but they implied it and i couldn't because i didn't know how to interpret it, the simulation at that point it was a, a different circuit anyway so i think this is what it amounts to you know because the simulator gives us so many benefits that it's very easy to take for granted if we rely on it very heavily like I do for designing a circuit and I've never really tried to build anything so I've never had to deal with uh, interpretation until lately I've tried to challenge myself by thinking in terms of asking myself that question how do I interpret it as a real world build and it's an important exercise to overcome any doubts about whether or not the thing would work in practice even before you've built it because now I have a rationale behind the interpretation or the translation I you know more significantly that I've uh, formulated to interpret this circuit in in real world terms um because the simulator gets to do things that the real world doesn't only because we have not been trained to do exactly what the simulator does and so we don't understand why is it so easy to simulate free energy and then ignore it because we're told by our professors if we were so inclined to take formal training which I have not been oh it doesn't work don't bother you know oh well you gotta use your common sense judgment that doesn't work right so it must be a fault of the simulator no it's our fault for not understanding not going into history. Oliver Heavy said, my God, that's 140, oh, what is that, 140 plus years ago? I mean, good grief, or something or other. That, that's a long time for us to be asleep. Literally, we have been asleep all that time. And a few people have come along who've been awake, but they haven't transferred up to us their wakeful state. They've tried to, but they didn't succeed, did they? Charles Proteus Steinmetz, that's one. Uh, another one that comes to mind is, um, oh, who's another one? Oh, there was another one, I forgot his name. Well, anyway, there are these electrical engineers, not inventors, but electrical engineers. Oh, Gabriel Cron. Yeah, these are people who 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 uh, came up with a plan, you know, not an invention so much as a plan. And we don't get it. We just don't get it. Now, it's true Gabriel Cron was not free to talk freely because he was under contract to his employer. But still, he wrote us two big books, wasn't it two on tensors and uh, and um something or other? I mean, it must be in there somewhere. You know, the secret to uh, how he was able to do what he did. But um, be that as it may, we, we don't get it. And it's so simple when we go back to history. Things in the past were oh so simple and have gotten so complicated that we've gotten, confu well, we've gotten pedazzled. We've gotten distracted. Not confused, so much as distracted by the excitement of everything that's so new. So we almost have to go back to the old times in which things were so simple to try to analyze what they did. We'll have better luck figuring out the secret to free energy than trying to an uh, uh, analyze anything else that, which came after them. And I think Oliver Heaviside is a perfect example of something that's so fundamental. It worked. And it was so simple. If we can understand that, we can, it will, I mean, we'll be miles ahead of everybody else. Now this secret to free energy that the subsequent development of the uh, Oliver, Oliver Heaviside solution to the transatlantic telegraph cable problem of the 1880s, this secret only involves coils.
because this secret only has to do with a magnetic field and only coils and a magnetic field is only important to coils it's not important to diodes diodes don't create a magnetic field it's not important to resistors it's not important to capacitors so it's only coils that we are sh that we are giving a unique identity and we have three to choose from either the coil is uh, a simple um, coil of um, enameled magnetic wire which is going to be copper so it's going to be a diamagnetic coil or else um, it'll have a ferromagnetic material such as bare iron wire wrapped around it <clears throat> giving it a, a mixed property of diamagnetism and ferromagnetism or else it'll be a enameled magnetic wire composing a coil that has an aluminum a bare aluminum coil wrapped around it giving it a mixed um, blessing of both diamagnetism and paramagnetism so there's only three identities but they only pertain to coils so when you do the wrapping I would imagine um, let's say of iron it goes back to the other side of the coil and thus shorts so to speak shorts out this preservation or retention of the magnetic field as well as giving it a unique signature to itself because it's not electrically connected to the circuit to the coil but it is electrically connected so to speak to itself but only for the purposes of transferring the magnetic field along its length back to the other end of that um, exterior wrapping be it you know iron or aluminum or whatever um, so we are only giving a unique identity to the coils and so all the other components including the coils will but most significantly all the, all the other components are exclusively going to be interpreted in terms of voltage drop alone will determine their relationship to each other but also unite them at the same time because that's what voltage tends to do meanwhile the magnetic field that we're boosting around the coils we're giving them a unique signature so that their magnetic coupling is going to be unique by comparison to the other coils nearby um, okay what else um, yeah this is only about coils and this is really where free energy falls apart when people attempt to create it is they don't understand what to do with the magnetic field and not understanding what to do with it they do nothing and we get nothing we get a comatose circuit even though the simulator told us something different you know, this is uh, you know I know that the only reason why Paul Falstead's simulator is so easy to create free energy is a it's not considered realistic you know something in the real world but be it is if you know how to interpret it it's the way he constructs his transformers and if we can solve that mystery then we can translate all the free energy circuits that I had designed and so many variations they all predicated on his transformer being a current source and most transformers don't do that and I don't really have the answer to how to do that in the real world I just have some ideas about some of the answer but I know it's something more than what I've already been able to figure out it's it's uh, slightly more involved not too much more but slightly more and I haven't figured it all out so I don't really know how to do the translation so those circuits look weird they look foreign they look alien they look like they don't belong in the real world yet they do no simulator lies it just has a very unique uh, spin or twist or interpretation to a, re a real world situation that we don't know what that situation is and the simulator simulates it and it's it's in all likelihood unconventional which is why it's we blame the simulator when we should be blaming ourselves well maybe not upon thinking about it some more I realized maybe that's one way to do it Another possibility is to be more strictly in the tradition of what 
was done with the Oliver Heaviside solution. In other words, <clears throat> the magnetic um, ribbon that was wrapped around and then was uh, excised, you know, a certain amount was removed, a few miles uh, of length was removed at either end. They didn't, you know, one end of that magnetic wrapping did not go and connect with the other end. So why should I do that? Um, so then that really signifies that you're giving an identity to that coil because it's not going to self-loop back to itself. It's just going to be cut short just prior to the two terminals. Now, I don't know how to do that with a coil um, because my temptation is to wrap the coil at right angles. <clears throat> um, you know, going inside the coil and then going outside the coil. And this is in addition to the fact that the coil is around the core, a similar core. It could be iron or it could be aluminum. Um, but if the wrapping goes at, at 90 degrees, you know, along the length of the coil, rather than around its um, perimeter, um, how do you cut it short? You don't. You can't. But you already have, by virtue of the fact that you're only doing it around the coils and not around the other components of the circuit. So it's already fulfilled to come short of the two terminals of the circuit because the other components are non-magnetic non oriented. They don't, their, their purpose, you know, the diodes and the resistors, they're not... Um, intended to create a magnetic field or to modify the magnetic field, let's put it that way. So there are already the two ends that are come short that you don't wrap the uh, iron or the aluminum around so you can do the whole coil and get away with it and still fulfill that modification that came subsequent to Oliver Heaviside solution, namely snipping the iron wire a little bit on either end so that it comes short of the terminus, the terminal on either end. Um, because I think wrapping it at right angles is probably the right way to do it, you know. But that's not the way Nathan Stubblefield did it. So, you know, I have to caution myself and, and you that I could be wrong. When Nathan Stubblefield did his uh, patent on, um, although they, we're told never to interpret patents, um, at fa take them at face value because uh, they've probably been altered and they probably have left things out. Because Nathan Stubblefield ran the um, iron wire in parallel to his copper wire. The copper wire was sheathed or insulated with um, a cotton sleeve, and the iron wire was l left bare. But they were run together by filer style and then wrapped around the iron bolt core so that you would get a checkerboard. If you, if you cut a cross-section across everything, the windings, and the bolt core, you would get this checkerboard pattern of alternating uh, copper wire and uh, iron wire in both a vertical direction as well as a horizontal direction, so rows and columns, um, so that each copper wire was more or less surrounded by iron without having to wrap in a circular fashion the copper wire with uh, iron wire before wrapping that bundle around the iron bolt core um, and still have to be able to do multiple layers of copper windings um, yet all of those windings would be mag magnetically coupled to each other because they'd have the parallel iron wire running alongside on four sides of each copper wire so maybe that's the right way to do it but in my mind my hunch is um, no not to do it that way, but just take the whole coil and wrap at a perpendicular around it along the length of the coil, um, either the iron wire or the aluminum wire. Um, now that brings up the question, well, are these um, coils, the, the, the copper portion, a single layer of turns? Or can we get away with multiple layers? I don't know. And what impact would that have? I don't know. Um, or do we wrap each layer? Whoa, that's a heavy thought.
but again at, per, at a perpendicular. Now it shouldn't really matter you would think because we're using either bare iron wire or bare aluminum wire and so there's no electrical um, geometry anymore. So what if I wrap it sideways? See? So it doesn't matter because if I wrap it sideways, well, it does kind of matter because most of the strength of your magnetic field traveling along the wire will be along the wire, the length of the wire, and not through its sides. But it will go through the sides all the same. Um, so I don't know. There's still questions left open, you know. I, you know, I haven't solved everything, obviously, in my head. Uh, there's still questions left open, and it's, le it's left to be seen how many different variations in which you apply this principle of wrapping a coil with another coil. How do you go about it, and how many different ways can you go about it, and, and what's the one that gives you the results you're looking for? I don't know.